If you're chasing the most accurate sound from your space, I get it. My inbox is flooded with messages asking the same thing. Should I upgrade my monitors or should I get a subwoofer? Even a few people suggested I try dual subs with my Neumann K310s. So I went down the rabbit hole and I learned a few hard truths about monitor selection in the process. When a sub helps or hurts your accuracy and what gives you the best translation in your room. So both before and after getting these subs, the results from my monitoring have been incredible. To begin with, the 310As on their own measured plus minus 3.25 dB down to 27 Hz in my space with the Sonarworks correction. The 310As are perfect for my size room. The lowest axial mode is 33 Hz. And the first thing I realized and I was really surprised after getting the subs is that my variance in frequency response, as in the deviation, didn't improve. But what I did notice is that it is important to have a monitor system that can reproduce frequencies down to your lowest mode in the room, as modal support plays an important role in the frequency balance of your space. So this was aha moment number one, where monitor selection is critical before considering subwoofers. In fact, not monitoring selection, monitoring system. So I want to start mathsing. All right, my current space's lowest axial mode is 343 divided by two times 5.2. That's 33 Hertz. The 310As are perfect in here. But if my monitors were, let's say, a Neumann KH120 that reproduced down to 44 Hertz, in that circumstance, you would need a subwoofer for this setup to work in this room. Or instead of a subwoofer, having a larger monitor like the 310s. Ultimately, the goal is to ensure sufficient bandwidth to reproduce lower frequencies to meet your modal distribution of the room. And you can see in my room's response that without the subwoofer, that room mode at 33 hertz is excited just before the bandwidth of the speaker dips out. Had that room mode not been reproduced, that's the little red line down there, the response of the playback would have started rolling off at about 48 hertz at the next highest mode. Now, modal support and even distribution of room modes is something that is plotted in a Benalo graph and was explained with great detail and understanding from my interview with Yesco from Acoustics Insider when I was planning this space. What do we take from this first part when it comes to monitor selection? Well, the first thing is calculate your room's lowest axial mode. And it's simple, 343 divided by two times the length of your room equals the frequency of your lowest mode. Secondly, find out the frequency bandwidth of your current monitors. Often manufacturers will document this in the manual. Ideally, you wanna look for the plus minus three dB deviation down to the lowest frequency to make sure your monitoring system digs down past your lowest axial mode. If your current monitors don't do that, if your current monitors roll off before your lowest axial mode, a subwoofer can be a solution. Here's a table I plotted based on room sizes and frequency responses of the Neumann KH monitors. And you can see here, the KH80 has a low cutoff of 57 hertz. Maximum room length for that would be three meters. If your room is longer than that, this is gonna struggle to reproduce the frequencies at lower modes. So that whole discovery putting the subwoofers in helped me learn how to quantify monitoring systems, whether or not to have bigger speakers or smaller speakers and a subwoofer or when and when not to choose a subwoofer for the use case of system integration and getting the most out of your room. And that is a tactful or, or, or tactile, tangible benefit to understanding your monitoring system subwoofer or no subwoofer. Now I've integrated the subwoofers, I wanna talk about the benefits of subwoofers specifically. The main one is that it's extended my system bandwidth into lower octaves. And this has been awesome for picking up really interesting details in mixes that I'd otherwise be monitoring on headphones for or using Isotope Audio, Audio Editor's RX Spectrogram. Um, the other day, I was working on acoustic track. There was some little sub rumbles in these open sections. And what it was, was steps of people in the room 
whilst the person was recording. So they must not have had a shock mount. And these are like 15 hertz just coming through the stand into the mic, vibrating. And um, I picked them up straight away. Like they were night and day, straight there for me to pick up. Usually, like I said, Isotope RX Spectrogram, you have it in extended log. You can see those lower frequencies if they're metering and then you go back and then you mark them on your session and you play back that those sections they're very hard to pick out you can pick them out on the 310s but because they don't have that clear extension down low they're not straight away audible and obvious so that was a great that, that, that has been a great asset to a mastering setup where i'm doing qc having these stereo subs the subwoofers also take pressure off my main monitors the 310s get a rap for not being able to drive as hard as other speakers and this is true the 310s have a ceiling at which when you push the output too hard, they self-limit or the low end starts to choke up and distort. But it's really only an issue when you start monitoring at pretty loud volumes. Not excruciatingly loud, but slightly uncomfortably loud, they'll start to break up. And that's because the 310As are a completely sealed enclosure, which means the design relies on no portal resonances in order to increase the efficiency of low frequency volume. The low frequency reproduction entirely relies on the excursion of the driver alone. So what happens is as you increase the amplitude, there is more driver excursion and you add complex harmonic material into the equation with low oscillation, high excursion, and that is a recipe for driver's performance to suffer. Having the subwoofers though, managing the low frequency reduction reproduction takes the load off the 310As, meaning they don't have to work as hard to provide output. Since installing the subwoofers, what has this meant? This has meant complete linearity. No matter how soft or high I crank the volume, the frequency response and translation of the system remains completely locked in step. It's no longer crapping out at the top, it's just I can get it nice and loud, I can dial it down nice and low, and I've got this clean gain to keep pushing. The next benefit of having the dual subs is the transient response in the low end is insane. I opted for the 750s because they're a completely sealed enclosure, which means no ports or portal resonances to help reproduce those lower frequencies. And that's something we spoke about before. The benefits of this is like the 310s that are completely sealed, the low end transient response is tight as like it is ridiculous. The only trade off in having a completely sealed system with no ports is I don't have as much access to output as what ported subwoofers would. That said, you got to consider the size of your room for my size room. Two 750s is perfect for my monitoring needs. It gives me ample amount to crank it really loud. If I was in a larger room than this, I might opt for larger subwoofers or subwoofers with ports. But for this size room, it's 5.2 long, 3.6 wide. This is an insanely accurate and good setup where I don't need to have much more louder output than what I'm getting already. Now, these are some benefits worth weighing up when deciding whether or not to have a subwoofer in your system. You have to pair these benefits with the needs of your monitoring. Now, before we get to some summary and conclusion and takeaway points, I want to talk about complications of having a subwoofer because the scary part of subwoofers is I've never integrated a subwoofer into a space. My biggest concern was phase alignment and how they were going to integrate with my monitors. And while subwoofers can extend the bandwidth or frequency re reproduction bandwidth of your system, uh, and it can also increase your headroom and make you be able to crank th things louder, it also introduces issues to your monitoring if they're out of phase with your main monitors. For myself, I didn't want one subwoofer. I work mastering records. I want a stereo integrated pair. I opted for stereo subwoofers. So the left channel and the right channel would in integrate as a full range system. My goal for my space is accurate monitoring stereo field translation and having stereo subwoofers helped nullify many of the issues integrating one subwoofer into a room often comes with, like managing time delay and phase between different monitor positions or moving the subwoofer around to get it to resonate in the room the right way. It was simple. I got these subwoofers, 
I made sure the driver's face was in line with the driver of the three 10 A's before tuning the subwoofers with the MA1. MA1 is Neumann's automatic monitor alignment DSP integration. And that is a system you use to tune the subwoofers, the speakers, the whole system, and it stores the calibration file on the subwoofer for both the subwoofer and the satellites. What it's actually doing is, is, is tuning a entire system, not just getting the phase of the subwoofer right, it's tuning the whole thing, like a sonar works or an IK arc or a Trinov. Now, I will say, Having that system took the guesswork out of managing the phase and balance relationship of my subwoofers in this space. Also, one of the really neat things of all the monitor DSP solutions out there and that I've used, having the calibration file for both the subs and the mains functioning directly and living inside the subwoofers with no intermediate drivers or aggregate devices on my studio computer or hardware boxes externally, has made the integration seamless and easy. Like, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I was stressed about integrating subwoofers. It's a really damn good system. Uh, so what I want to do now is with that, like that, that, like all the stresses you can have with subwoofers, I didn't have any because it had the MA1. But I want to get onto the graft results, the takeaways from this endeavor, and also dive into the truth no one tells you because that's how I've titled this video. And I want to, I want to represent that accurately. I'm going to get into the graphs before the key takeaways. So the graphs is here is with no sub. Okay, we've got no subwoofer. Um, it reproduces very accurately down low, just the three tens, and this. Here is the subwoofer with the house curve of the MA1. I wasn't a fan of the house curve of the MA1, as the house curve gives a little bump in the top and a little roll, a little bump in the lows and a little roll off in the highs. I have for the last decade tried to monitor as flat as possible. So this bump in the lows is a little bit hard to get used to. If I hear something that's bumping up a little bit in the lows, I always want to cut it. So I ended up using my own custom EQ curve in the MA1 software and ended up on this. Now, this here to here, both really good responses with sub or without, but there's a few little caveats to this. And we're going to look at the spectrogram. If we look without the sub, down at 40 hertz, down at 30 hertz, I don't really have much ringing out. When I introduce the sub, it starts to, like, this is still really tight response, but at 44 hertz, it just holds out for a bit there. Now, this doesn't necessarily sound like a ring when I'm monitoring, because we've got to look at the key over here. That blue line at its lightest is 40 decibels below the impulse. So it's 500 milliseconds decay down 40 decibels, which is, number one, low frequency... Low frequencies our ears aren't super sensitive to. And number two, negative 40 decibels is really down low. So that was the first thing. The next thing with integrating the subwoofers is the distortion. So if we look here, we'll go to one moment, wrong one, SPL. Not too happy about the amount of distortion the subwoofer introduces. That said, so it's like, what, what does this mean? So this is your fundamental frequency. The white line is total harmonic distortion. The red line is second harmonic. The orange is third harmonic, which means if we split this out, when you play 16 hertz, 30 decibels below that, it'll resonate at around 34 hertz. Mind you, that's 30 something decibels below the initial impulse. That's about 5% total harmonic distortion. It's not ideal um, if you oppose it to something like this, which is without the subwoofer where I don't have that THD or those, those harmonic distortion numbers down that low. But it is something. Now, in a perfect world, you wouldn't have that. But how do I put this? I've been monitoring with it. And in the reality, this is all plotted graphs. And that, it's really good to have this information because it helps inform me how to tune my system and how to better integrate it and, and get the most out of it when I make these measurements. The thing is, you have to pair these graphs with using the system in the space. I tried playing some sine waves at these frequencies to listen out for those harmonics. 
that were measuring from that were actually measuring on this graph. And when you have a sub frequency playing at 90 decibels at 16 hertz, number one, it's like it's there, but you're not perceiving very easily these harmonic distortions higher up. Now, this is my experience I'm talking about. So this is technically on paper without the subwoofer, a cleaner, truer system based on harmonic distortion. This with the subwoofer is a larger bandwidth system. So, and also arguably a more accurate system. But for me, going from here to there, having these extra octaves has meant the world for me. And now I want to talk about the truth no one tells you when it comes to subwoofers. Subwoofer or no subwoofer is irrelevant. What is completely relevant is how your monitoring system integrates with your space. For accurate monitoring, you need a system that matches the bandwidth of the modes in your space. So if your main monitors don't reproduce low enough, yes, a subwoofer is a need. Yes, larger speakers would be a need. But what about the wants? What people don't talk about the wants? There's a vanity want, and then there's two practical ones. The vanity one is headroom for loudness. I love the fact with two subwoofers, these two 750s with the 310s, I can crank the speakers, get really clean gain, and my drivers aren't working super hard. Like I can have it loud and it's nice and clean, but that's a vanity one. That's an exciting one. It's a show off one. What about the practical ones? Now, the practical ones is low frequency extension for critical listening. For me, this is really important. Does everybody need to hear down to 20 hertz on this loudspeaker system? Absolutely not. Do I, as a mastering engineer, am I always looking, if not listening when I'm monitoring, if am I not assessing and critically analyzing spectrogram plots and looking at my data when it comes to mastering a record? I absolutely am. And being able to pair that data with something audible or actually pick it up with my ears before I even have to look at a graph, the subwoofers are great. They're a great want. Next is another one, and this is a huge luxury with these 750 subs, is the DSP convenience. I'm not sure about other subs on the market, but the Neumann MA1 system in the subwoofers has made the whole integration of my monitoring system impeccable. I used to smash my head over the table when it came to other DSPs which lived in my computer. Um, I'm not going to say names because I don't think that's fair on other companies, but software-based room correction which lives on the computer you have to, if, if there's any issues, I've had issues with some where as aggregate devices, it's dropped off or I've got my AirPods and it's connected to my Mac and it's crashed the driver in my session. The DSP convenience of this is it just lives in the subwoofer. I don't have any intermediary between my converter and my subwoofer. My subwoofer stores all the, um, stores all the equalization and the integration and the phase relationship. It is hyper, hyper convenient. I cannot stress that enough. So that's another one. So for me to summarize this, the one key takeaway should be how you consider your space as a monitoring system. Sub or, for sub, or, sub or sub, no sub, like I said, is irrelevant. You want to have a monitoring system that fulfills the bandwidth of your space. Subwoofers have some great benefits and some great luxuries, especially with the Neumann 750 sub. Um, those M the MA1 is just been insane. Um, and you'd think, and this is, I'm just going to go on a bit of tangent here. You'd think it's just an EQ or it's just an alignment system for the sub. No, it integrates each channel as a complete integrated system. So that is like left speaker, not only the phase between the sub and the main, it does the EQ for the 310 to fit within this room. And it's magical. So there you have it. Subwoofers. 750s I got in the room for you guys I gave him a crack and they're for at least my needs as a mastering engineer they are serving above and beyond I hope you enjoyed this and if you've got any questions leave them in the section below I'll also say if you've got any experiences or you've got any contrarian views I invite them to because I know this is just this video is 
sort of lives in a silo of my experience using this, but I also encourage discussion and discourse to expand each other's learning in this topic in our profession. So please do that as well. And until next time, take care.